Welcome to Growth Track. Heartland Church, in partnership with North Central Indiana Bible College, is excited to offer this discipleship program that will include, encourage, educate, and inspire you to be the person God has created you to be. Growth Track is divided into tracks and modules that dive deep into faith, answer questions you have, and connect you with Jesus. Combined with recommended readings, opportunities to grow through service, and a community of believers on the same journey, your transformation is inevitable. If you would like to become a student and earn college credit for this class, go to heartland.church and click on the Growth Track page. There you can see the requirements, application, moral code, and other information about Growth Track. If you prefer to just view this class for your own information and growth, that's great, and we hope this helps you grow. Let's get started. All right, now we're back, and I think we're right on chapter 3, and uh, uh, read chapter 3, verse 1, and you'll think of that old song, Behold the love of God, uh, behold the manner of love the Father has given unto us, that you called us sons of God and daughters of God, right? If you think of vacation Bible school, you probably got that little song running in your head, right? He loves us and calls us his children. That is such a precious promise. That is such a done... And then he starts talking about some done deals here that are amazing after this. We know our own. We know the world does not know because the lost and us are not compatible. And I will say this, if you feel compatible with the world, you're probably deceived. And I'll get into that a little bit in a second here. But abiding in Jesus removes sin. Um... Verse, uh, chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law. This is going to sound harsh, and then, but I want to talk about this afterwards. For all sin is contrary to the law of God. All, in the Greek, means all. In other words, everything. All sin is sin. There isn't light sins and heavy sins. There's not respectable sins and disrespectable sins. It's sin is sin to God. And you know that Jesus came for the purpose of taking away our sins. And there is no sin in him. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. That means people are trying to. When people do what is right, it shows they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows they belong to the devil, who has been sinning from the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Listen to this one, verse 9. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they can't keep on sinning. Not they won't, they can't. Because they are children of God, so now we can tell who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. Now think of it like this. You were to walk over to the to the Yellow River there, and you're looking down there, or let's think of a, a faster moving river even, and going through there, and it's just running through there, and you look at the riverbank, you pick up a water, uh, a rock outside the water on the riverbank there, and look at it. It's not going to be clean, sitting on a riverbank. You want to see what the rock looks like. It's kind of dusty. I wonder what kind of rock this is. I'll stick it in the water, rinse it through as the water's running through it, look at it. Oh, that's pretty. I like that. It's got some sparkles in it. It's different. Than, I'll set it down, and I'll walk away. If I came back next week after putting it back in that spot and picked it up again, is it going to be clean or dirty? Be dirty again. Then it might dawn upon me, you know what? If I stuck the rock into the moving water, it'll continually be cleaning itself. I don't have to keep cleaning it off and cleaning it off and cleaning it off. That's kind of how it works. If you're abiding in Christ, there's a cleansing effect to that, and we don't have to step away from God, then come back and have Him clean us off, step back from God, come back and clean us off. If we abide in Him, His words abide in us, there's a cleansing effect that is continual. And a lot of people don't think of it this way. They think they have to go in there, and after a little while, they sin, repent, sin, repent, in that vicious cycle. This is a relationship with God because the goal isn't just to stop there. As we've seen a little bit, the goal is to be able to direct that water to others to help get them get cleansed. It's not to stay with us. So the, the love of God flows out of us to others should be the goal. Because <clears throat> the Bible says out of our bellies flow rivers of living water. Guess what? Just like every other gift of the Spirit and fruit of the Spirit, it's not for us, it's for others. The love of God coming through us cleanses us and it has the ability to draw others to get cleansed by Him too. 
Chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Dear children, let's not merely say we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth so that we'll be confident when we stand before God. Now you see the tone and feel of this letter is not earning salvation. It's because you're abiding in Him, you cannot continue in a sinful lifestyle and your actions that follow that will prove that you're abiding in Him. Live out your faith. Chapter 4, starting in verse 4, it says, But you belong to God, my dear children. Sorry, I'm dealing for you guys who are watching here. I'm dealing with some allergies. <clears throat> but you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the Spirit who lives in you is greater than the Spirit who lives in the world. You might know it as greater is He that's in you than He that's in the world. But people gloss over that first part. You belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people. We don't live like that's true. But it is. It's not a trick Bible. It's the truth. The spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. We're not compatible with the world, and the spirit that's in us is greater than the spirit that's in the world. We keep trying to be quiet like we've got to shrink back and be ashamed of the gospel and be ashamed of this because we, and we speak out against sin. What we have is greater than what they have. And it's time to bring that to the light. So they have a chance to at least be exposed to the light and exposed to the love of God instead of trying to stay in the dark so that people are comfortable in the dark. It doesn't work. It doesn't save anybody. And it hardens us. Those people who belong to this world, they speak so they speak from the world's viewpoint. And the world listens to them. Isn't that true? The world knows their own and they listen to each other. But we belong to God and those who know God listen to us. There should be such undeniable unity right now coming in the body of Christ that it should be uncomprehendable to the world. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. This is, this is simply how we know if someone has a spirit of truth or a spirit of deception or the spirit of error. If you can't tell, then you're probably one of the deceived. That's the bad news. The good news is if you're one of the deceived, you can cry out to God and ask Him to help you to understand that. The Holy Spirit says if we lack wisdom, ask. And He doesn't get upset when we ask. He wants us to boldly and unashamedly ask for wisdom when we don't understand. If we feel like we're, we're meshing to the world too much and we're like, if there's confusion, ask for clarity with a true and sincere heart motive and He always answers that. But we should be uniting with Christians and not trying, and if we're getting along with everybody in the world and the church, something's not right because those two are not incompatible. Now, it doesn't mean that we're not loving them. There's not some kind of compassion for them or even a respect for, the, for them in their life. But you shouldn't be really united on a, a united front in a lot of in some of these areas, especially when it comes to sin. When we take a stand for sin in this day and age, it repulses the world as much as sin should repulse us. The world is really acting more like they're supposed to act and the church isn't acting. It never shocks me. It never upsets me when a, when a sinner acts like a sinner. People get all upset because someone fleshed out and did all this and that. And I'm like, they're not saved. Why does, that, why does that shock you when a sinner acts like they're sinful? It shocks me when a Christian does, though. When a believer does. Because we should be loving each other and spurring each other on and blessing each other. Not blessing each other out, if you know what I mean. So the world and their viewpoint is not compatible. If it is, you are deceived. As, as we live in God, our love grows more perfect, complete, mature. They go like that. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. But we can face Him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love, or perfect love, has no fear... Because perfect love expels all fear. Remember, you can't have a vacuum. This perfect love pushes out fear. It pushes out worry. It pushes out self-centeredness. All these different things, fear, pride, even sexual sin, money, they all do the same thing. They point the spotlight back on me, 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 instead of him, him, him. We're supposed to die to self supposed to buffet our flesh, not buffet our flesh. 
If we're, uh, so such love has no fear. First love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows we have not fully experienced this perfect love. How do we experience that perfect love? Throw ourselves at the mercy seat and let Him cleanse us. God does not need a cooling off period because the sin was really bad this time, so He needs a little time to cool off before you can really go to Him and ask for forgiveness. That's not how God works. Now, your sin may cause a wound that needs time to heal. Your conscience gets damaged because you did something there. Someone's doing something they shouldn't do. Uh, and there's natural consequences. But as far as your status with God and your relationship with God being restored and, and in the right standing, you lay it out before God, and that's the, that's the deal. From that point on, the battle's already won. Because <clears throat> you transferred the battle from you to Him. So we love each other because He first loved us. We stuck the rock in the water, and now the rock's clean. But then we can kind of move the rock to channel it over toward another rock, and another rock. Because of what's in us comes out to others, we can affect other people. We should be splashing all over everybody the love of God. Not because we're trying, or we're trying to act pious, or trying to act uh, very holy. Just because of as natural as breathing, we should be expelling the love of God because that's what's in us. For every child of God defeats evil, this evil world. That's chapter 5, verse 4. And we achieve this victory through our faith. The battle is won, but it's demonstrated through our faith. It's already won, but we demonstrate it out there. And then... Uh, Again, I, I already touched on there, but I have to move on to Revelation and second and third John are good ones too, but don't have time. So in Revelation, what time how much time I have left? Alright. I can wrap up the rapture, the end of the world, and the millennial and the forever after this in nineteen minutes, no problem. Okay. So when I was in college I took a class. And I actually taught a class on this later, but it's uh, it's. Um, but one of the things we learned is we went through all these mythologies like Gilgamesh, uh, Beowulf, uh, Greek mythology, and um, really it was amazing how similar a lot of these were. And then I studied something called the monomyth. Joseph Campbell came in and talked about the hero's journey. And you can look at certain movies like Star Wars. Literally, George Lucas went and followed the monomyth and the hero's journey step by step all the way through did not deviate. You could literally look, okay, here's, okay, yep, yep, yep. And it went through this path. And it starts out there and it has a, or you see the hero in the ordinary world. Then there's a call to adventure or a call to action. Reluctant hero refuses kind of call, but then finally goes out and does it. And they meet the mentor. And then there's a crossing of the threshold. The mentor dies. They have to start, they have to make that move to start to fulfill their destiny. Then there's tests, there's allies, there's enemies, there's these shapeshifters, people who you think are a friend, all of a sudden they're an enemy. All these things happen, and then they approach the ordeal, the, the time of temptation where they want to quit, the dark night of the soul, so to speak. Then there's ordeal, a death, and a rebirth. Then there's a reward, a seizing of the sword, and a road back and a resurrection, and returning with the elixir or the reward. Or something that's, that, that sets other people free. That's the hero's journey. Now one of the things you can see, and why does that work for almost every epic action adventure you see, you want to see that. The worst movie you see is the hero goes all the way through at the end, the bad guy goes, ah, boom. <laughs> that movie stunk. Because inside of us is this innate ability to know that this needs resolution, and that there is something bigger than ourselves so that can bring this about and there's a hero coming through there. That's because that's what God created us to long for. And we see that perfectly in Jesus' life. Jesus' life, ordinary world was not here. It was at the right hand of the Father. Creating. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word God was Elohim, the plural form of God. Jesus was there at the beginning. All things are upheld by the word of His power. Jesus is part of this thing. Ordinary world was heaven. He gave that up. The call to adventure was to come down and live on this world as a human to die for us. He came down there and he became flesh. He initiates his public ministry, crossing that threshold. 
He had mentors, John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit. Right? Temptations, friends and allies, enemies, a lot of tests. Temptation from the devil, from the Pharisees, all these traps. The dark night of soul, the garden of Gethsemane. Lord, take this cup from me, not the, nonetheless not my will, but your will be done. And then he surrenders to that, goes and dies on the cross. But then as, as he dies on the cross, he goes down to the abyss, descends to hell, but he gets the keys of hell and death, gets the sword. Then he resurrects and comes back with the elixir, his very own blood to put on the mercy seat of God. And now he comes back as the hero to, to set us free. And the cool part is, then he tells us to go on that journey. And the book of Revelation shows us that if we go on this journey, the story is already written. He's the hero. And all we have to do is die to ourselves and let him take us on the journey he has for us. Because he's got this all wrapped up already. We just got to play out our roles. I can watch Star Wars a hundred times. I still enjoy it because the adventure still hooks you. Jesus watches us live our lives for him and he's hooked. He loves it. It never ends for him. He just connects with us to this and takes us on a journey with him. So looking at the book of Revelation, this is where the journey, he's showing us the end. And all these times where we feel like, ah, people, people just get so... They talk out of both sides of their mouths. People get mad about God. Why doesn't God do something about evil in the world? Then they read the Bible. Well, God wipes out all these people. Why, why would God do that? Well, they were evil. <laughs> you want to go, hello? Right? But what we see here, though, is when God does this and deals with it, there's an old song, my boyfriend's back and you're going to be in trouble. Right? Well, when God comes back, there's going to be, you're definitely going to be in trouble if you're on the wrong side of things. So we have the setting for Revelation where he's talking about the wrap-up of all this stuff. And it takes place around A.D. 95 or 96. We know this because John the Apostle was trying, they tried to kill the guy. He couldn't even boil him on oil. He'd come up out of oil testifying and they sent him to an island, Patmos, which is like a volcanic island that has very little shrubbery. And they had a lot of little islands that they sent people to prisoners. It's not sure if he was exiled to live or as a prisoner there. But he was there and uh, he just... The Bible says he was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. Like, he just got there and he just did what he did anywhere else because his tent stakes were loose. He was the pastor and a leader and revered and, and a lot of people looked up to him and he was a prisoner and he was tortured and he was exiled. It didn't matter to him. He still served the same God the same way. And he walked in love. Tent stakes were loose. The audience were, uh, of, of this book is, is the churches, but also all of us, Really? because it talks about what was soon to happen and what would happen in the, in the come in the years to come. So the purpose was to reveal the events that would take place immediately before, during, and following the second coming of Christ. This book completes the prophetic themes introduced in previous times in the canon of Scripture and by Jesus himself. In places like the Olivet Discourse and all these different places, Jesus talked about, this is where you hear Porky Pig, that's all, folks. He's wrapping it up. So it gives us the knowledge and anticipation of God's future program as an incentive to live a holy life committed to Christ. Because it's worth it. The hero you always want, there's always a temptation to cross over to the dark side, but the light side is worth it if you stay the course. Revelation uses symbolic and apocalyptic language. Uh, Again, something that they were very, very familiar with in that time of the writing. And so it brings the Bible to a climax of, along with many prophecies. It was the last inspired book and put at the end of the Bible, rightfully so. Uh, the four Gospels open up with the first coming of Jesus. Revelation deals with the second coming and what happens after that. So um, the second coming of Christ and years prior are graphically revealed in a way that's never done before. Daniel touches on it. Ezekiel apocalyptic touches on some stuff. But this really brings some vivid details. And... Um, this scope of this class, have you, anybody ever seen an aerial picture of a, a big property or, or something there and you see the aerial picture and you're like, oh, there, oh, look at that little thing, that's, a, that's my car, hey! That's kind of what we're doing here. We don't have time to wrestle with the text as much as we would on, on, on a 
class on Revelation and Daniel, and that's one that you can peruse at your leisure. It's already been covered, and will be covered again if you stay around long enough. This one's the overview. We're over there taking pictures, but we don't have time to dive bomb and check out the, check out the barns. But as we're overviewing, we can, we can touch on a few things, though. This book amplifies end-time events, and many details are given culminating with a new heaven and a new earth. And gives absolute proof that God will deal with human sin and bring the consummation, the salvation of those who trust in Christ. And all the people said, this isn't fair, this isn't fair, this isn't right, these people are rich, these people are poor, this is that. God has perfect scales. Nothing will be unjustly balanced by the end of all this. And we talked about last week, eternity compared to our life. If you ever get into too, too high a level math, anything divided by infinity is zero. Our life compared to infinity is zero. Yet we live like our life's the infinity. And what's after this is zero. Kingdom thinking, not world thinking. They're incompatible. This world's not our home. So, what I would recommend to you is be rapture ready. You read things I talked about, alluded to, uh, read 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2, and it talks about it should scare anybody who's lukewarm or on the fence. Because it talks about when you are presented with the truth and you deny it, you are deceived and hardened in that area. The bad thing about deception is it's deceiving, right? And once you're deceived, you don't realize you're deceived anymore. And once you're hard, you don't feel or care that you're deceived anymore. You're presented with the truth and you're not operating it. It it doesn't, it's not enough. You start to harden. You start to be pulled. It's like sitting in a boat and just letting the current drift. and And you're supposed to go this way, but the current's pulling you that way. You can even have the boat pointing and facing the right direction, but it's pulling you that way. You feel like you're going all right, but you're going backwards. You've got to row. Of course, this world is going to pull us one way, and we've got to go the way God's calling us. This world's not our home. So, there is a day of reckoning. Solemn warning to those who are not prepared and not rapture ready. Revelation 1, verse 3. God blesses those who read the words of this prophecy to the church. Preachers, in other words. But He also blesses those who listen and obey what it says. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. Faith is an action word. Face the verb. Right? We act on what we hear. For the time is near. Verses 4 through 8 and 10. Uh, I'll start reading this and then I'll kind of stop for a second. How am I doing on time? Eh. This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace be to you from the one who is, always was, and still is to come. This should really be ringing home if we're listening to the names of God right now on his Sunday mornings. Um, but this is talking to seven churches that were actual churches at the time in Turkey. And this was also a letter. So we know the historical context to first look at Revelation. This was to be taken, especially the first part, was literal. There was a historical context. There was an actual audience. And the audience was believers. Okay? And it says, a sevenfold, and it says Grace and peace to you from the one who is, always was, and will still be to come from the sevenfold spirit before his throne. And from Jesus Christ. So let's look at the sevenfold spirit between, before, before his throne real quick in Isaiah 11, 2. And the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. It's talking about Jesus. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. Now, the spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and, and the fear of the Lord. Let me read those again. Number one, the spirit of the Lord. That's the word, all capital L. O-R-D. What's that? That's Jehovah. Remember week one of uh, the name, uh, a.k.a. God? This is Jehovah. Number two, spirit of wisdom. Number three, spirit of understanding. Number four, spirit of counsel. Number five, spirit of strength. Number six, spirit of knowledge. Number seven, spirit of the fear of the Lord. Read the rest of Isaiah uh, 11, verse 3. He will delight in obeying the Lord. This is still Jesus. He will not judge by appearance nor make a decision based on hearsay. He will give justice to the poor. Yes, indeed. And he will make fair decisions for the exploited. The earth will shake at the force of his word. This was not the first coming of Jesus. One breath from his mouth will destroy the wicked, and he will wear righteousness like a belt and truth like an undergarment. This was not the Jesus with the lamb on his shoulders looking like he's in a shampoo commercial. This was the King of kings and Lord of lords coming back with a vengeance. 
So let's look at Revelation. We started back. Let's go back to Revelation. Instead of the sevenfold spirit of God before his throne and from Jesus Christ, he is the faithful witness. Revelation 1, 4 through 8, and 10 through 16. So I'm back on that again. Sorry. He is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from the sins by the shedding of his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for his for God his Father. All glory and power to, to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven and everyone will see him, even those who pierce him. It's amazing. The Bible prophesied about TV way before TV and, and computers. Jesus could be as big as Mount Everest and not all eyes would see him without TV and technology. That's a side note. I just love that, though. Um, so it says, uh, it says, Yes, amen, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. It was, I was, it was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the Spirit. Suddenly, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. Sounds very familiar to Isaiah 11, right? It said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands, and standing in the middle of the lampstand was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a golden sash across his chest. That righteousness, right? His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were polished bronze, refined in a furnace. If you look in... Uh, the time when Abraham had the covenant with God, you'll find that same description of the person that God went into covenant with on behalf of Abraham. It was the pre-incarnate Son of God. Um, his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves, and he held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came to his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. That's the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's my Jesus. That's why the battles are already won. Who is going to stand up to him? I'm on his side. <laughs> I'm with him. <laughs> um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to jump, because of time's sake, right to the end here and look at the end of the story. Revelation 19, 11, 16. Then I saw heaven opened and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and Troy. This is my Jesus. For he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire. This is the same book, but the end of it. And as on his head were many crowns, he was, and a name was written on him that no one understood except himself, and he wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest pure white linen followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a wine press. On his robe and thigh, at his thigh was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of all Lords. Revelation 20 talked about this happening at the coming there, and, and it says there's a great white throne. This is the throne where people who are not saved got to stand before him. The earth and sky fled from his presence. They found no place to hide. They saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. The books were open. Yes, there's the book of life. There's also the book of remembrances. Everything you've done, the only thing to get something out of that book is to have it washed out. And then also the book would be the word of God. You're judged by that. If you don't have Jesus' righteousness, you're judged by the law in that book. You will not measure up without Jesus. All the books were open, including the book of life, and the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, the death and grave gave up their dead. All were judged according to their deeds. You don't want to be in that group. I want to be judged according to what Jesus did, not according to what I did. The death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is a second death, and anyone whose name was not recorded in the book of life was thrown in the lake of fire. Spoiler alert, if you're judged by your own deeds, your name is not in the Lamb's book of life. He will wipe, then it goes to, then Jesus turns to the righteous ones. He says, He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne, this is God. Look, I am making everything new. Then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. The King of King, Lord, Lord, and then God Himself says, Write this down, this is true. I want everyone to know this. What does He want them to know? It is finished. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit these blessings, and they will be, I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards, verse 8 of chapter 21, cowards, cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, immoral, these, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshippers, and all liars. Their fate is the fiery lake burning with sulfur. This is the second death. 
Jump to 20, Revelation 21, 27, just in case you didn't get it the first time. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the book of life. Revelation 22, 14, blessed are those who wash their robes. That's with the blood of Jesus, right? They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and can eat fruit from the tree of life. Outside the city are dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol washers, and all who love to live a lie. Revelation 22, 18 through 21, and I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. Anyone who removes the words from this prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and in the Holy City described in this book. He who is faithful witness to all these things, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. When God wraps this up, there will not be anything hidden that won't be made to light. And that's why our goal should be to be as transparent as possible. I'd rather let it be in the light now than be put in the light later. As we read through this real quick, wrap up 20 seconds here. Go through your life living for God. Go through your life repelled, repulsed by sin and false teaching and make sure you live that to other people. Love believers, love other people, follow God no matter how rough things get and be looking for the blessed hope and encourage others to do the same. All right. That concludes.